Sushant Kishore today met not just Rahul and Priyanka Gandhi but also Sonia Gandhi. Not his first meeting and something bigger is in sight, not just UP and Punjab. That's what NDTV is picking up from sources right now. Infection rate rises again as Prime Minister warns of a third wave. This after the Prime Minister's warning. Now the Uttarakhand cancels his, its Kavad Yatra. The government also says a third wave forecast is not like the weather forecast this year. Warnings of third wave come as vaccination continues to drop. Tamil Nadu Chief Minister now alleges vaccine discrimination. Kerala Chief Minister meets with the Prime Minister asking for more vaccines. And finally, monsoon covers India. It arrives in Delhi a month after the forecast and now worry over the monsoon deficit begins. A 16-year-old attacked by a 21-year-old in South Delhi. Attacked by an axe. The boy, said to be a stalker, now caught by the police, but the girl dies. Delhi High Court says delete the defamatory tweets uh, against the minister's wife. And India's largest ever Olympic contingent is ready for the Tokyo Games. Prime Minister gives his wishes. Hello and welcome. Those were the headlines of this RM Sonal Merotra Kapoor. The big story we are tracking and exclusive details available with NDTV now about what exactly happened in that meeting with Prashant Kishore and the Gandhis. We thought earlier it was just Rahul and Priyanka Gandhi, but now NDTV picking up from sources that Sonia Gandhi also part of that meeting and something bigger seems to be brewing. Srinivasan Jay takes you through the details. This is big breaking news that we have coming. It appears that the meeting between uh, political strategist Prashant Kishore and the Gandhis was not just between Rahul and Priyanka Gandhi, the siblings, but all three Gandhis. Rahul and Priyanka were present in person. Sonia Gandhi joined via a link. So it was a meeting between all three Gandhis and Prashant Kishore, which is itself quite unprecedented. What we've learned is that this meeting had nothing to do with either Punjab, the Congress Punjab crisis, or Uttar Pradesh elections, as some were speculating. This is a meeting about, and I'm quoting here from highly reliable sources conversant with exactly what has been happening, something bigger. Something bigger is the language that was used to describe what this meeting was, from which we can infer that this is something to do not just with the assembly elections, but clearly with an eye towards the 2024 Lok Sabha poll. Also, I was told that this is not the first time that Prashant Kishore has met with the Gandhis, indicating once again that this is not something that has just happened overnight. This is something that has been in gestation, unbeknownst, by the way, to most of the media. Until today's meeting, the media had no idea that several meetings had already taken place in the course of the past month between Prashant Kishore and the Gandhis, either all three of them or several of them in some combination or the other. This does seem to indicate that there appears to be the possibility that Prashant Kishore, who has managed to be a transformative figure for several of these state assembly elections and for regional parties and leaders, is he now going to link up to India's grand old party, India's faltering opposition party, which as many have pointed out, doesn't simply appear to be in any position to challenge the BJP for 2024 elections. Now it appears with these meetings and with the possibility that we are told that this is about something bigger, that chance of a PK Congress tie-up seems to be looming closer. But of course, will it still work out? Will all the final dots and T's and all of that be joined? And what final shape it takes? All of this is still very much up in the air. Prashant Kishore had already made it clear that there's no possibility of a third front to take on the BJP in 2024, as some were speculating, that mm. any such attempt requires the Congress to be on board. And now that he has been having these meetings and there's a talk of something bigger, as I mentioned, could it be that we see PK Congress 
coming together. That's the big political development. The big political development over there, something that we'll keep tracking right here on NDTV. But talking about the national twists and turns to the ones that never seem to be ending in Maharashtra. After alleging that the Chief Minister Thakre and the Deputy Chief Minister Ajit Pawar were keeping an eye on him, today the Congress Maharashtra President Nana Patoli took a U-turn. He said his statements were misinterpreted and he did not mean anything at all. In fact, he put it on the BJP saying the opposition is trying to create differences within the Maha Agari. The Congress's loose cannon in Maharashtra avoids the media as he walks into a Congress meeting at Tilak Bhavan in Mumbai's Dadar area on a Tuesday morning. Earlier, Nana Patole, state Congress chief, walked back from his latest Gugli in which he had claimed that he was being surveilled by his own alliance government in Maharashtra. मुख्यमंत्री आणि उपमुख्यमंत्री माझ्यावर लक्ष ठेवतात अशा पद्धतीचं त्याला चढून वळून आपण जे दाखवलेलं होतं आमचं महाविकास आघाडी सरकारचं एकमत आहे आम्ही राज्याच्या विकासाचं जे आमचं धोरण आहे तीन दिवसाच्या पहिले ज्या भाषणाचं काही या संबंधात नव्हतं तरी त्याचं क्लिप काढून दाखवण्याचा जो प्रयत्न झालेला आहे हा याचा काही संबंध येत नाही दिस लेटेस्ट क्लॅरिफिकेशन फ्रॉम पटोले केम आफ्टर मेनी सिनियर काँग्रेस लीडर्स रिपोर्टेडली कन्वेड देअर डिसअप्रुव्हल of a statement on camera though they try to present a united front blaming the bjp koi aisa ye nahi hai ye sab jo hai abhi ye hamara jo andolan chal raha hai mahangai ke against usko dabane ke liye zyada ye bjp wale hi oppress kar rahe hain kino parties government mein ek saath hai par hamari strength hamari taakat har party ab apni taur par badhane ke liye koi aapatti kisi ko bhi nahi honi chahiye unko bhi nahi hai but there is little doubt that the repeated barbs by patole and import from the bjp are only straining the congress's alliance partners even leading some say to overtures between the sena and the bjp the principal opposition party hai congress unka prabhav agar badhega to bjp ka prabhav ghatega nana patole ji ka model kaun sa hai prabhav badhane ka wo model ko thoda research karna padega Amid all of this, AICC Maharashtra in charge H.K. Patel and Cabinet Ministers Bala Saheb Thorat and Ashok Chavan met NCP Chief Sharad Pawar at his residence. It has now become a habit where Patoli makes a statement which he later backtracks and the party tries to cover it up. But in all of this, there is a risk that he might hurt the alliance partners, in turn hurting the Mahavika Sagadi government. In Mumbai with camera person Praveen Ji Rohit, this is Purva Chitnas for NDTV. Shifting our focus to COVID now and just look at these pictures. Pictures coming to us from the hill stations of India. Pictures that should scare us, should remind us that all is not well and that if this goes on, then a third wave is pretty imminent. This was reminded by the Prime Minister as well today and by the Health Ministry as well. And why these pictures, pictures should be scaring you? Let's look at that now. Let's look at this graphic which talks about the R factor. In simple sentences, what does it really mean? Well, R or the reproductive number of the virus tells you how easily it spreads in the population. It's average number of people onto whom it will really infect and pass the virus. Simply put, the higher the number, the more contagious it is. So do we have a third wave warning linked to the R factor? Well, very in the fastest rise, that we have seen of the reproductive factor since the mid of February from a low of 0.72 to 0.95 in just 31 days. It was the 14th of February when the R factor was this high and quite literally cases were on our way up. In fact, 19th of February, the second wave began to take root and average daily cases started rising and ended up snapping the declining trend. The key difference this time around is that mid-Feb, the average cases were just about 12,000, 12, beg your pardon. And now it is about 41,000. So it is a big concern. Silver lining, however, that the average daily cases continue to decline since the second wave peak. So what do we really watch out for? Well, if this declining trend snaps the case rise, that's the bottom line and that's the big worry. And after all these details came out, Prime Minister spoke about it. The Uttarakhand government 
uh, decided to finally cancel the Kavar Yatra this year. Prime Minister meanwhile also spoke with the chief ministers in the northeast where the positivity rate is much higher than the national average. With these pictures in mind, a warning from the Prime Minister. Hill station mein, markets mein, bina vast pehne, bina protocol ka amal kiye bina, bhari bheed ka umadna, maa samatna hu, ek chinta ka vishay hai, ek thik nahi hai. Ye baat, logon ko samjhana jaruri hai, कि तीसरी लहर अपने आप नहीं आएगी। हेडलाइन में आप लोगों के सामने प्रस्तुत करना चाहूँगा, जिसमें ये कोट किया गया कि हम दो साल से घर में थे, तो वो हमारे लिए जेल के समान थी। जब हम थर्ड वेव की बात करते हैं, तो हम थर्ड वेव को मौसम के समाचार की तरह से हम उसकी गंभीरता और उससे संबंधित अपनी in fact, the Prime Minister met the chief ministers of the northeastern states, which have most of India's districts with a 10% plus positivity rate. Parts of northeast India are still under COVID curfew with some relaxations. But a few pockets are in total lockdown, like Assam's Jorhat and its neighbouring Golaghat, due to a rising number of cases. We are imposing a complete lockdown. That means uh, we are closing down the and grocery shops, the vegetable vendors shops also. The Prime Minister will also virtually interact with Chief Ministers of Tamil Nadu, Andhra Pradesh, Karnataka, Kerala, Odisha and Maharashtra on 16th July at 11 a.m. to discuss the COVID situation in these states. These six states, along with Assam, contribute to 85% of the daily average cases. With Ratnadeep Chaudhary in Guwahati, in New Delhi, with camera person Manu Nair, this is Sukirti Devedi for NDTV. With thunderstorms and heavy rain, the southwest monsoon finally arrived in the national capital almost a month later than the Met Department had initially predicted. Well, this meant traffic jam, water logging in several parts, but also meant the water shortage that Delhiites had been facing for so long did not stop. There is not enough water as residents continue to fight for it. And all this is happening as water wars between Delhi and Haryana continue and Delhiites struggle for water tankers. Delhi roads flooded after Tuesday morning's heavy rain. Ironically, the city does not have enough water supply for its residents. 34-year-old Renu has been waiting for a water tanker in Delhi's Deoli for the last five hours. It's been the same situation for the last 15 days with her needing to buy water from private tankers. <laughs> The Delhi government blames the Haryana government for the water shortage as it did not release Yamuna river water. Kejriwal ne shoot bolne ki PSD kar kiya. हरियाणा के ऊपर बेबुनियाद आरोप लगा रहे हैं। All the water treatment plants in Delhi are working at less than half their capacity. Wazirabad barrage should have water levels up to 674.5 feet. It is reduced to 667 feet. Only 55 MGD water treatment is happening in Chandrawal water treatment plant instead of 90 MGD. The same process is reduced from 20 MGD to 12 MGD in the Okla plant. I will tell you, 16,000 Qsec Pani Hathni Kund Pe Haryana Sarkar ne chhoad diya hai aur ab wo agle 3-4 din mein Dilli pohan jayega. On Tuesday, the Haryana government released Yamuna water and the hope is that Delhi's water problem will be solved when 16,000 Qsecs of water reach the capital. The Delhi government has approached the Supreme Court on the matter. The crisis is same in uh, maximum areas of Delhi. In fact, few posh localities are not getting water. These are the real pictures. As of now, 
in the fight of Delhi and Haryana, the common man of capital is struggling. In New Delhi, with the Sashi Kanjha Saurabh Shukla for NDTV. A week after the death of Father Stan Swami, the question is what happens to his legacy? His supporters and associates are working overtime now to ensure his work that touched so many lives of tribals and under trials is taken forward. A week after the death of Father Stan Swami, a haunting silence hangs over the campus of Bagecha, the organization the Jesuit priest founded and nurtured over the last few decades. His room was opened up after months and his belongings dusted and cleaned. Disruption nahi bolenge. Ham logon ke liye motivation hai. Vishesh karke bagecha ke jo bagecha se jude huye rehne walon ko aur stan ke colleague jo Jesuit hain. Are you scared also? No, we are not scared. <laughs> Stan's death has uh, released our fear. You see. Comrades in arms like Dayamani Parla feels his death has given the movements he started a new lease of life. Christian missionaries of all denominations are coming together to take Father Stan's work forward, notably his campaign to free under trials languishing in jails for years. We are working with the Jesuit. Bagaicha, which was founded by Father Stan Swami, will continue being the voice of the voiceless in spite of all the intimidation. Father Stan Swami's passing has blunted hostility from all quarters, including the Jharkhand government, say his associates, which has brought relief and strengthened their resolve to keep his legacy alive. With camera person Hariban Shrai, Manish Kumar, and Joshua Chin for NDTV. Ten days to go for the Tokyo Olympic Games and Prime Minister Narendra Modi today interacted with the Japan-bound squad and some of their family members as well while encouraging them to win laurels. The Prime Minister also spoke about their journey. 126 Indian athletes will take part in 69 events across 18 disciplines in Tokyo. PM Modi spoke to 15 of them on Tuesday evening. Among them was world number one, Deepika Kumari. Namaste, sir. I the PM spoke in Gujarati with world number one rifle shooter Eleven Il Valarivan, who began her professional shooting career in Gujarat's Sanskar Dham School. Came to Elave Gujarati Bolejek Nay. Ha, sir, Kodu Kavadejaman. And even had a bit of banter with PV Sindhu over eating ice creams and the Fogart family. Sir, obviously, I <laughs> तो फोगाट फैमिली अपनी बेटियों को कौन सी चक्की का आटा खिलाती है? देखिए जो चक्की का आटा की है हम जो अपने गांव के घर की चक्की का आटा खाते हैं और अपने देशी के इंडियन एथलीट्स हैव ऑलरेडी स्टार्टेड अराइविंग इन जापान फ्रॉम टुडे in a new report uh, from the United Nations uh, says that uh, there was a dramatic worsening of the world hunger in 2020, much of it likely related to the fallout of COVID-19 and the multi-agency UN report has some shocking statistics that the number of undernourished people rose to around 768 million around the world. Where does Asia stand? Well, NDTV's Parmeshwar Baba breaks it down for you. 
A new multi-agency United Nations report says there was a dramatic worsening of world hunger in 2020, much of it likely related to the fallout of COVID-19. Even before COVID-19 pandemic, the world was not already on track to end world hunger and malnutrition in all these forms by 2030. Conflict, climate change, economic downturns have also challenged efforts to achieve full nutritional security. Now, according to the latest report this year, the report highlights that 720 to 811 million people around the world faced hunger in 2020. This number is approximately 118 million more people that were facing hunger in 2020 with respect to 2019. Now, if we break down the details of the report further, it highlights that more than half of all undernourished people, around 418 million of them, live in Asia. But Africa represented the biggest jump in cases, more than double that of any other region. And in Latin America, there has been an increase of 9.1% of the population being undernourished as we speak. Now, of the victims, children remain the ones who pay the highest price. The report continued with more than 149 million, less than the age of five, estimated to be afflicted with stunted growth. Maximo Torero, the chief economist of the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, has attributed conflict, climate extremes, and economic downturns, as well as slowdowns, as the major reasons behind the increase in the hunger undernourishment that we are facing today. Another crucial point, due to the high price of healthy diets and high levels of inequality, around 3 billion people in the world did not have access to a healthy diet in 2019. Much to our dismay, globally, the gender gap in food insecurity has increased further in the year of the pandemic, according to this UN report. Now, this report also makes an important call to really act and transform the agri-food systems. An increase of undernourishment of 118 million people is a huge challenge. There's also significant increase in stunting and obesity, which need to be tackled. The report recommended policymakers undertake a number of actions to prevent undernourishment, such as incorporating humanitarian, development and peace-building policies in conflict areas, strengthening the resilience of the most vulnerable to economic adversity and tackling poverty as well as structural inequalities. All right, that's all we could uh, wrap in this edition of News. Stay tuned to NDTV. Lots more coming up.